You are listening to the Wool Academy podcast. This is episode number 18. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth van Delden and once a week we talk to an industry expert from the wool industry supply chain from farm to fashion and beyond, delivering strategies and insights to be successful in wool and showcasing those beautiful stories wool has to tell. Today on the show we welcome Jeff Kingwell, who is based in South Africa, where he runs a farm producing merino sheep, angora goats and beef cattle. Jeff is chairman of the IWTO Sustainability Committee and serves in the working groups dealing with animal welfare and the environmental credentials of wool. Jeff is also a past chairman of both Cape Wool South Africa and the Western Cape branch of the National Wool Growers Association. Currently, he serves as vice chairman on the board of BKB, a wool broker business. Hello, Jeff. It's great to speak to you today. How are you and how are your sheep doing? Hi, Lisa. They, they're doing very well. We've just had some lovely rain in 2017. Um, we had a very tough 2016, particularly towards the end of the year. It was very, very dry. Um, the last time we was dry as this was in the, in the early 90s. But um, 2017 has been good. And when, when the grazing's good, the sheep are happy. That's good to hear. Well, let's just get started with our first question, and I would like to ask you um, a little bit, give us a little bit of background about yourself. Um, I grew up in the Karoo, um, close to where, where I'm living now. Um, my father's still living there, and um, he grew up there as well. Um, when I came back farming, my grandfather was still farming with my father on that farm. Uh, I trained as a mechanical engineer and worked for about six years as an engineer before I came back farming at about the age of 30. Um, yeah, and, and what, so we hear that you have been, your family has been involved in sheep farming for a very long time. What made you decide to also go into sheep farming like your father and also your grandfather before? I think growing up on a on a farm gives you a love and a passion for this lifestyle. Um, fortunately, I had the opportunity that there was a business I could come back to. So there are plenty of people who would love to farm, I suppose, who, who don't have the opportunity. In my case, I, I had the passion and the love and the opportunity. Um, obviously, I had an alternative career. Uh, I could have stayed working in the engineering field and I, I clearly remember my grandfather saying to me um, are you sure you want to come back farming because um, it's, a, it's a way of life it's not necessarily the best way to make money but um, uh, I've never regretted the decision I, I, I think it's a lovely place to have a family to raise your children and I really enjoy stock farming I enjoy working with animals and your engineer degree is also helping you on the farm every day, I guess? Definitely. Um, obviously, you know, in engineering, you tend to specialize and, and you don't necessarily use that specialist knowledge. But the general background knowledge that you picked up and the experience um, does help you. I was quite lucky that early in my career, I in, as an engineer, I was involved with project management, and that is definitely very translatable to uh, other businesses, including farming. Um, and so I suppose I was fortunate that I didn't uh, become a real specialist in, in a very small area because that most probably wouldn't have translated quite so well into quite a generalist type of work that um, is the task of a stock farmer. Yeah. <laughs> And tell us a little bit more about your sheep and your farm so that people can picture it a little bit more. Okay, the farm is in the Karoo, um, uh, northwest of Crofrenet. Uh, rainfall of between 250 and 300 millimeters a year. We high, we, the farm varies basically between 1,450 meters of sea level up to about 2,000. Uh, we have warm summers. We don't get as hot as many other places and, and very cold winters. Um, we farm with merino sheep 
um, angora goats and uh, beef cattle and think that um, in this environment they complement each other very well. Um, so if you say 200 to 300 milliliters of rainfall a year, so that's a semi-desert and what do the sheep eat? Is it, what, how should we imagine um, the countryside? Okay. Um, yes, I think you could accurately describe it as a, a sort of a cold semi-desert, uh, particularly in the winter. Um, the vegetation is a mix, mixture of shrubs and grass. And in the, on the higher mountains, the grass is fairly sour. Um, and, and that is some of the benefit of our area. It is a, a very good um, area to farm with, with sheep. Um, is that mixture of, of vegetation and, and mixture of diet that the animals have. And um, with the fact that you're semi-desert, we are quite drought prone, so that, that is one of our challenges. But by the same token, like now when we've had rain, um, the, the countryside is, is very good for sheep farming. And um, you, you tend to all over the world, you effectively, as your rainfall goes down, your stocking rate goes down. So you basically just carry the number of animals that um, the environment can sustain, uh, depending on, on the rainfall and the climatic conditions you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for giving a little bit more detail. And also, can you tell us a little bit, what does a typical day look like for you? Yeah, I, I, I don't really know if, if I have a typical day. It's a, it's a bit like asking what, uh, what our average rainfall is because it, it is so variable that um, it, it's very difficult. But yes, um, we, we have uh, in South Africa, we have um, staff on the farm that help us. Uh, in other words, there is a, a reasonable amount of availability uh, of labor. Um, so I tend to organize the day in the morning with my involvement with off-farm activities that you um, mentioned in the introduction, Lisa, um, I tend to have to spend more time as probably in the office than the, the average farmer. But um, on certain days, we, we, we tend to move stock reasonably quickly. We uh, ascribe to the holistic way of management. So um, most days, um, there will be stock that need, need to be moved um, and, and counted so that we um, maintain control and, and check that there's nothing wrong. And at the same time, there will be inspection of the stock while we're doing that. And um, then there will be the detailed type of work. Some days it will be inoculation, some days it will be maintenance. And then um, we do have a, a little bit of irrigation. At times we have water, so there, there's a little bit of... Uh, that sort of work involved as well. Okay, so you spend a lot of time outside on your farm as well as inside in your office. So, yeah. It's a quite, it's quite a good mix. Yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm always a, a happier person when it, uh, uh, when it moves towards the outside away from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and obviously you also use the term that your farm is your business and tell us a little bit about what are the different income streams for your business all right well um the merino sheep um particularly in south africa are, are very much dual purpose sheep and so the the income split between meat and wool depending on the relative prices and also on your lambing percentages and things like that will vary I would say between 60% to 70% meat, in other words, more meat than wool, and the remainder will be wool income. Um, at the current uh, high wool prices, it's, it's moving towards a 60-40 a split, but we still tend to get more income from meat. Um, on the uh, Angora goat side, they are much more a fiber dominant enterprise and so I suppose about 80% of your income there is um, on the fiber side um, they grow slower they, they they don't produce as much meat and then on the cattle side well it, it's all the, the income is, is all meat um, 
but we don't just sell animals for slaughter from time to time we do also sell breeding stock so that that would be a a source of income as well and something i learned the other day is um, farmers tend to not necessarily say how many sheep or livestock they have because it's almost like telling someone what is the, the amount on your bank account because the livestock is what you depend on isn't it well, well absolutely um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't suppose I uh, mind telling people, but I, I, I also don't uh, normally offer that information up because uh, if you, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, not, it's not so much a secretiveness thing, but um, I, I suppose we're not always comfortable speaking yeah. about how big your, how big your <laughs> business is. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't want to come across as if you're bragging about it. Yeah, exactly. No, I thought that was quite an interesting um, aspect of, of farming. And when you look at the challenges in your business, what is the biggest challenges for the wool growing side of your business? But basically, the, the biggest challenges are looking after the animals and, and I, I'll put it into two main areas and that is um, maintaining uh, good nutrition under all climatic conditions. As I said earlier, we have a very variable climate. Um, as you get drier, your, your climate does become more variable and with that the nutritional level of the grazing becomes more variable. And then um, the other big challenge is um, predation, and so they, they're both ongoing ones. Um, I suppose the nutrition one is, is, a, is a little bit easier to manage because um, it, it doesn't dry off overnight, so you can sort of see um, it coming, but uh, our main predators here are the blackback jackal and the caracal, or uh, in the common name we call it the red cat. And um, they also give us a lot of trouble at times. At other times, it's not so much of a problem, but um, uh, they definitely a huge cost to the business. And um, it's not something that we're ever going to, in my opinion, get under control. It's going to be an ongoing battle um, with how we manage our predators and, and effectively keep our predation losses down so that they don't catch our animals. Yeah, okay. Thanks for sharing that, those insights. And we already heard from you in the introduction that you have been very active within the national wool industry in South Africa and you have also been an active member and still are on international level in various working groups of the International Wool Textile Organization. What is your motivation behind your active leadership and engagement for the wool industry? Um. By and large, wool growing is a relatively, it's done in, in, in relatively small businesses. So the best way to, for wool growers to achieve anything um, is to work together. And, and that's why, so you, you start off by being part of your local wool growing organization. In our case, it's the National Wool Growers Association in South Africa. And, um, through that, you try and achieve things, lobby for things, uh, change things, but it's, it's a mouthpiece where these small little businesses can get together and, and speak as one. Um, I suppose in terms of motivation, Lisa, um, I, I think we, I, I believe one should try and do more than just look after yourself. And I'll get energized if when I'm involved in some of these uh, joint things if I feel I'm making a difference. You know, if, if you feel you offering up your time and, and, um, and, and you're not achieving anything, well, that, that does uh, make it difficult to, to stay motivated. But, but while you're making a difference, um, it, it's not that difficult. So it, it's, it is a big cost to me in terms of time. The flip side of it, it is um, enriching. You meet new people, you get exposed to new things. So it, it's not 
all cost. Um, there, there, there's definitely benefits, and and through that, that also helps you to um, be motivated and excited about it. Yeah, and speaking about you know meeting other people, how what kind of benefits do you see? Obviously, when you are at these international events or also on national level, you meet a lot of different industry members along the supply chain. How, what are the benefits for wool growers to connect to these other people within the wool industry? I, I suppose you, you put in a single word, it's, it's all about communication. You, um, wool has a very long pipeline, so different parts of the wool chain slash pipeline are, are far removed from each other. Um, but are they also geographically far removed because um, very little of a uh, very small percentage of the South African clip actually gets processed in South Africa uh, and even smaller percentage actually gets consumed in South Africa. So there's without getting together at these international uh, um, forums, there's going to be a, a great disconnect between the different parts. Uh, the wool growers won't be talking to the processors, the spinners, or the brands or the consumers, and um, they also won't know the, the, the challenges. And um, so I think that the big benefit is simply to get communication going. The growers, they know exactly what it is that people want, and the people, the brands and the consumers and, and, and the people at the far end of, of the pipeline uh, also have a better understanding of what it is possible for the growers to do and to deliver and 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 what and if there are demands that are, are so onerous that they will effectively put people out of business and and therefore um, cut off the supply of wool and and through that you you must probably be get to achievable solutions yeah no I agree and and I think it was always eye-opening whenever yeah, all the different supply chain members met and actually started to understand each other's issues and problems and how only together you could find solutions. And another thing that you mentioned earlier is that you, you use holistic management on your farm. And that's another question I wanted to get to is that one of the criticisms of the wool industry or also like having sheep is that it uses up too much land and that sheep supposedly contribute to desertification. But I had the chance of visiting you on your farm a few years ago, and you showed me the work you were doing against desertification by applying certain met methods, and I'm thinking it's this holistic management you were just talking about earlier, to reverse desertification. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Um, definitely. In, in my opinion and, and in my experience, um, well-managed uh, livestock uh, reverse desertification. So I don't think we can deny that, that farmers have made mistakes in the past. I don't think that any of those mistakes were made um, willfully. In other words, most farming businesses um, are family businesses and there's a desire to improve the business so that you can hand it over to the next generation if they're interested in carrying on. And and with that as, as background, no one willfully destroys the resource, which is actually the grazing. Um, uh, we have more knowledge nowadays, and so some of the mistakes I'm, I think that were made in the past were, were, can really be attributed to, to lack of knowledge. Uh, the principles that we apply is uh, to... to uh, graze reasonably intensively for short periods of time so that we give the plants uh, a lot of time to recover. Um, the theory behind that is you're trying to mimic what would have happened in this area before people were managing livestock where there were large uh, herds of herbivore antelope um, that were, were being, that had predators around them and they would stick together in large herds, graze a small area intensively and then uh, move on once that had been grazed or effectively mucked by dust and, and dung and urine. And, and so we're trying to mimic that um, because we feel that that's how, how it used to happen. And there's no doubt that um, 
if you do that correctly, we're seeing the improvement, we're seeing species change, we're seeing uh, the, the, a better coverage happening. And, and when you do it for long enough, you, either, you even see your, your carrying capacity going up. Um, so and also I think when people talk about um, wool growing using too much land or too much water, uh, you've got to look at what could you have used that land for alternatively. Um, it's not as if that water, for example, could have been used to grow vegetables. We're talking about a semi-desert that can only support grazing animals. So you're either going to grow fiber or you're going to grow meat or you're going to run game. And, and that's about the limit that you can do here. And, and game farming in our area is definitely... Uh, less environmentally friendly. Uh, the game can't move on the way they used to in the old days. So even when there are large game farms, they are still restricted in that area. And because you can't control the movement of game the way you can with uh, livestock, you can't practice this intensive grazing where you graze a, a, a relatively small area quite intensively for a, for a short period of time and then give it a long time to recover. And, and then move around your farm. The, the game are all over the farm and they tend to concentrate on the, the, the better places and, and, and damage them and, and not really use the, the, the other places. So uh, when you see uh, game farming in our area, uh, it's definitely a, uh, a worse choice in terms of the environment. And so uh, they, 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 the, the, the system where you um, penalize people for using a lot of land and a lot of water is flawed because you're not saying, well, what else could I have done with that water? It, it makes sense if that water could have been used to grow vegetables or something like that. But this is water that is simply falling on the land. It, it wasn't going to run off in any case. And the better we manage our land, the less of it will run off. And, and um, that shouldn't shouldn't create a penalty um, in the in the systems that that um, rate how much water you use for um, growing wool. Okay, I even learned something new. I didn't know this whole aspects um, in comparison to game farming. So thank you very much for explaining that. And there was another thing that I observed when I was visiting you on your farm is that you were planning to have wind turbines um, on your property. How is that project coming along and is that something that many wool growers in South Africa look into more and more? Um, yes, so it's, it's still in the planning stage. There, there are a number of people who already have turbines up. So effectively it's, it's a little bit beyond your control because um, if you happen to have a farm that has good wind, in other words, you've got a, a good resource, then, then it's a possibility. And for a lot of people, it's not a possibility. Uh, unfortunately, in South Africa now, there's a little bit of a, a political struggle happening about renewable energy, where the uh, monopoly energy producer Eskom is um, not wanting to add uh, renewables to the grid at the moment. And, and as a result, there's a bit of a stalemate. Um, uh, our project is advanced to the point where um, the testing's been completed, the environmental impact study's been completed, but um, it can't progress any further until there's a possibility of getting a purchase agreement from the, the national energy uh, supplier, which is ESKIM. And, um, so, yes, we, we're in a bit of a, a stalemate. I think long term it'll still happen. I'm, I can't, um, but I, I, I don't see it happening in, in, the, in the foreseeable future or, or in, the, in the near future, at least. Yeah. Okay, well, then we'll keep an eye on that project and wish you good luck that things will change in the positive direction for you. Um, before we close, how can the wool industry do more for farmers like yourself? Um, to be successful? Is there something you would like to see more? Well, I, I, I think we, it, it fits in with what I said earlier, where you, 
the wool industry needs to work together. So I, I gave a reason why we as farmers need to work together because we're all relatively small businesses. And as you go down the pipeline, the businesses tend to become bigger and, and can do more of their own promotion or their own research. But uh, I think we need to work together internationally. I think we need to promote wool um, in the broad sense. And, and that means also doing research so that we can prove some of these um, uh, attributes like the sustainability of wool and things like that. And the only way we're going to do this is by working together. So what I would like us to see us doing as a, as a whole industry is all parts of the industry getting together and, and pooling resources, both time and money, um, to, to achieve this because uh, our competition are doing that. Um, uh, they're... Uh, in many cases, particularly on the synthetic fibers, where there are very big companies that, that produce the, the raw material, um, they sort of drive that process. Our production is, is a, a little bit more scattered, but um, by the same token, if you don't get out there and uh, inform people about the positive attributes of wool, um, where are they going to learn, it, learn about it? So we, we definitely need to work together, pool our money, pool our time, and uh, keep on promoting a fiber that we know and believe has wonderful attributes, but um, we, we can't keep that hidden from, from our consumers. Well, those are good words to close this episode. Um, before we say goodbye, what is the easiest way for people to connect with you? I think email. Um, uh, so yeah, e email would be the, the, the easiest. And um, I think you've got my email. Do you, uh, mm -hmm. will, you, will you just add it there? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff, for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm guessing now it's quite hot because it's summertime in South Africa and you will all rest during the hot time, but then you have to go back outside and get some work done. Yeah, well, well it's, it's actually cooled off a little bit. Ah, okay. as, I'm, as I mentioned to you earlier on, we've, we've had a, a, a reasonably wet 2017, and, and that's been the reason. So normally February would be very hot, and because we've had a bit of rain, there's a bit more cloud cover. So uh, December was exceptionally hot, but um, January and February um, haven't been that bad. But you're right, uh, we, we at this time of the year, we tend to start work early in the in the cool of the day you definitely don't want to be working with um, livestock at this time of the day and uh, have a have a long lunch break for the people and the animals and then uh, work again work in the afternoon again yeah well i wish you a good day then and thank you once again for your time Pleasure. Thanks, Lisa. Nice talking to you. We hope you enjoyed this episode with Jeff Kingwill. If you want to find out more about Jeff, you can visit the show notes at elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 018. Once again, visit elizabethvandelden.com forward slash 018. Don't want to miss out on any of the future episodes? Then subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher and also like us on Facebook at Elizabeth Van Delden. Thank you and see you next week.